Uh, so Tommy, let me start sharing my. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm going to stop. Just checking again, you can see the yep, slides. Yeah, 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 yeah. So should we start? I think we're at time. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Awesome. So hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our awesome lunch panel here today. My name is Aditya Sharma. I am a program manager uh, at Microsoft. And I work with Autonomous Stars, as do my panelists here today. And we're super excited to get into this discussion. We will cover a variety of topics. We'll be talking about where we are today uh, in the world of autonomous driving in 2021, where we're going forward. Um, and you know, uh, hopefully this will be a super productive lunch session for you. So uh, before I kind of go ahead and start introducing our panelists here, uh, just some couple of general housekeeping rules. Uh, so the session structure is going to be, we'll have the first kind of 30-ish minutes uh, each panelist will be giving you a a five minute position talk uh, about you know what they work on and what the what top of mind for them is, uh, and then we'll have the kind of the second half or the the last forty five minutes of the of the session uh, we've reserved that for Q and A, uh, and this is where we uh, you know we'll we'll take both the both questions from from you guys as well as just just have a you know have a discussion amongst ourselves on on different topics pertaining to autonomous driving and. Uh, but you know we want to we want to make this uh, super. I mean, it, it's it's hard being in uh, in a virtual space like this. But we want to keep it as uh, you know uh, discussion focused and as you know uh, incorporate your guys's questions in this as much as possible. So in order to do that, uh, please use the. So you have two options. I believe there's a Q and A kind of feature uh, in the Zoom client here, uh, or you could just simply put in your questions in the chat box, and you can do this. Uh, throughout the event, uh, during the panelists talks, uh, or, uh, you know, during the discussion portion. So as you do that, uh, we'll, we'll try and incorporate those as we go. So with that, let me just introduce our panel here today. So uh, like I said, we, we have a, we have a great cast here for you. Uh, so I'll, we have Nirmut Saxena, who is a distinguished engineer at uh, NVIDIA. We also have Srijani, uh, who is a distinguished technologist joining us from DXC Technologies. Uh, we have Lee Harrison, uh, who is an automotive IC test solutions manager over at Siemens EDA. And then we have Sweta Mehta, who is a domain consultant and TCS. And uh, last but not the least, we have James Herman, uh, who is a grad student at CMU, but he is also the founder of CMU's uh, Robo race, race, autonomous race car team. And CMU, for those of you who don't know, it's Carnegie Mellon University. It's also where I went to school. Um, so with that, that's kind of the overall, here's the panelists. Um, I'm gonna take a step back and I will hand over the uh, mic to Nirmal, uh, who's going to talk to us about stuff he works on. Nirmal, over to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Aditya. So uh, just I want to get a quick disclaimer out of the way before I give the position. So uh, this uh, position talk, as well as uh, my views in the Q&A would be my own and not my employers. So with that out of the way, uh, I think uh, the, this uh, panel position has three parts. So let's start with the first. Uh, what is an autonomous car? So very quickly, you know, you see on the right side of the top picture, a driver with the hands on the steering, uh, foot on the brakes or accelerator is being replaced by a drive system that comprises uh, camera inputs, uh, ra radar, LIDAR is to create 3D view of the world uh, in even low light conditions and uh, maps, database, as well as online GPS. Um, so all these inputs are processed uh, for object detection uh, as well as path planning. 
one aspect. There are other aspects of uh, automotive driving that and different other algorithms are used. And typically, at least from a standards perspective, the processing uh, rate is 30 Hertz, meaning 30 frames per second are being processed, but actual computations could be faster. And all, with all these inputs, uh, it is creating uh, a control uh, signal situation or actuators as is known in the automotive circles. And that kind of determines the car's position and velocity. So uh, a complex system such as these uh, uh, would require, uh, you know, the computational capability in the orders of uh, 100 uh, tops. Tops is for trillion operations per second. Uh, so with this complexity, it is uh, stringent. Uh, it's very important that uh, proper reliability uh, uh, measures are taken. And that leads us to the second part as to why. So uh, there is an automotive standard called ISO 26262. And it has stipulated certain targets for you know, what is called level five uh, uh, driving, which is all fully autonomous, no involvement with the driver. So to put those targets in perspective, I think it's important to sort of look at uh, the accident statistics. So at least from the US side, you, know, you can go to the NHTSA side and the, there's gobs of information about uh, different uh, trillion miles driven and uh, fatalities and all that. So if I take all those numbers and if you do the math and distill that into something uh, familiar with the safety targets, uh, you would get a statistics like, you know, if you drive for one hour, uh, the probability of getting into a fatality is one in a million, which is 10 power minus six per hour, or uh, to get into a crash uh, is roughly one in 10,000 for a drive time of one hour. So that's kind of the number. So if you look at the safety targets, I, I think uh, the most important target is again, the failure probability. It's 10 power minus eight per hour. So it's one in hundred million uh, for, for a drive time of one hour. And the additional metrics the standard has placed is a coverage uh, for random hardware faults, 99%. Um, uh, and these random hardware faults include both transient as well as permanent. And there's a time metrics called FTTI, fault tolerant uh, uh, time interval. Essentially what it is, is if you have a fault uh, the time of fault occurrence to the corrective action being taken, that delay has to be less than some stipulated time. So the standard has not defined, but based on use cases, typically folks pick about three frame time, which is equal to 100 milliseconds. So um, again, you can see that uh, the, the safety targets are at least four, uh, two to four orders of magnitude better than the accident statistics. And notwithstanding the fact that not all hardware failures result in fatalities or crashes. So this is actually a very good number. And so it takes me to the third part of the panel position, which is how to get there. So again, there are two pieces to this puzzle. Uh, one is, uh, uh, one thing that I did not mention in the safety targets is the standard also stipulates certain requirements of what, what are called systematic faults. In, in ordinary uh, parlance, it is design uh, defects both in software as well as in hardware. So, uh, so before I get there, uh, I think uh, in the autom autonomous driving, there is a very important algorithm which is based on machine learning or deep learning. Uh, and folks have raised a lot of concerns about uh, equating accuracy of uh, deep learning perception engine with safety. So there is some truth to it, but there is also some falsehood. So I, I think maybe this would come in the Q&A session. So my perspective is you have to look accuracy from the standpoint of sort of context. So in cases where the objects, like if you're, you're detecting a traffic light, red, green, and blue for, for the vehicle, or some object like the red bicyclist in, in the ground truth image of an ego car, uh, then the accuracy better be 100%. But for remote objects like one pixel worth, uh, I can have accuracy equal to zero. So, so I think we, we, when we do studies and sort of uh, qualify the safety attributes of a vehicle you need to take into that account. But with that said, uh, the important issue is, you know that again, uh, auto safety standard has not given any quantitative metric on systematic faults, but the implicit assumption is the, the coverage has to be 100%. And, and you know that uh, with current systems, it's impossible to sort of get uh, software uh, completely bug free. So for that, I think we need to do a very thorough validation and it would require um, 
sort of millions and millions of driven miles type of simulation. I think before the panel, there was this discussion and we can pick this up in the Q&A. Um, but I think there are ways to do the validation uh, with virtual reality and creating scenarios that are unique. You don't have to drive trillion miles to validate the effectiveness. So uh, there's promise there, but it is a challenge problem. And then the second part, which is random hardware faults, transient and permanent. I think transient uh, fault coverage is pretty much a solved problem with the advances in error correcting codes. And uh, again, we can have more discussion on that. For permanent faults, uh, getting 99% uh, coverage is not easy in the FTTI limit. I, I, of course, we have today a lot of uh, uh, tools, ATPG tools that can give you 100% coverage, but not in the 100 millisecond. So we can, can discuss this aspect later, but there are ways to solve that. So one way to address permanent fault coverage, it leads us to the second part, which is diverse redundancy. So one of the issue with permanent faults, even if you have 100% coverage, is this. So if your fault occurs, and if you have a simplex system, uh, then the detection will happen, but then the recovery and repair uh, may take much longer because you have a simplex system, you have nowhere to go. So that sort of, from an availability perspective, it forces uh, some sort of physical redundancy where you fail over. So once you have that, um, then I think the coverage on permanent faults becomes an easy problem. And it also adds another dimension, which I call reliability gain. Uh, I think uh, the traditional way to look redundancy is it has an impact on mean time to failure. Uh, like if you look at in data centers where people use uh, for disk drives, uh, mirror disk drives. So it increases the mean time to failure by a factor of 1.5. So that won't give you a very comfortable feeling. But one of the things that we did at Stanford long time ago is there is a deep dependence between reliability and uh, mission time. So if you take that into factor, you can show that for the mission times of interest, like one hour, or even in Uber's case, 10 hours, the reliability gain is of uh, six orders of magnitude greater for that finite time. So we can exploit that. So there's more to redundancy than just uh, improvement in mean time to failure. And uh, you can hit the targets very safely. So that's one point. And you need diverse redundancy because as I mentioned, systematic faults, it's impossible to get 100% coverage. So this is where diversity will help in trying to detect if there are any leftover systematic faults. So that, that marks the end of my Awesome. Presentation. Thank you so much, Nirmal. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a couple of things that, that really stand out there and we should definitely cover that in, in Q&A. Uh, sure. Yeah, this is, this is great, thank you. So next we'll, uh, we'll move to Srijani. Uh, Srijani, over to yeah. you. Thanks, Aditya. So what we'll cover here uh, will be focused on like reinforcement learning and quantum compute and how we can get autonomy out of it, right? So, so uh, as you all might have heard that we are entering an era where uh, quantum accelerators coupled with classical uh, optimizers will accelerate the resolution of like targeted problems. So the, the, the uh, sharp difference between the compute, the quantum computers are like aiming to utilize capabilities to become highly efficient through like quantum gates, right? So they, they are also manipulation of ones and zeros, but there is a uh, qubit, have a third state called like superposition that uh, actually permits them to represent both one and a zero state and at the same point of time, right? So the four, the, the four scenarios can be represented at the same time through like superposition by using two qubits, which results in the reduced uh, data crunching time. So our focus, what uh, Nirmal talked about, like trillions of miles, right? Unless we can reduce that kind of uh, compute processing time, we it, it's going to take longer and longer to get to that autonomous driving status, right? So then what actually what we have also absorbed, I mean, in the few hypotheses that has been done is that the, the conventional hardwares are actually beating the quantum machines by quite a margin uh, at lower difficulty or lower complexity range. However, as difficulty increases, what happens is that exponentially, uh, the time taken by the quantum remains approximately the same. However, uh, if you take the other HPC chip, it increases proportionally. So basically what it means is like uh, quantum will like fare well in problems of uh, greater difficulties and uh, complexities as opposed to the problems which have a lower complexity. And that, that is where HPC will shine. So when coming to OEM, so they can actually use uh, quantum compute to perform advanced simulations, right? In areas such as vehicle crash behavior or like train the algorithms used to, uh, used in like in, in the development of autonomous driving software, right? So given uh, the potential to reduce the computing time from several weeks to like few seconds, 
OEM could potentially uh, ensure that like part to part communication is also uh, almost near real time. Right. So, but uh, it is like it's, it's a evolution. Obviously, the gradual evolution is like very evident. But the large companies, like unless they strategize now, like for the near term, mid term, and the long term, for these uh, to to uh, get quantum compute in their uh, ecosystem, it's going to be uh, like a huge leap otherwise. Right. So, if you if you think about near term, right, with um, I mean, if you do the path of like real time hybrid solution, where bits of a large problem can be processed in an HPC. And computed in a quantum, uh, and then the results of that HPC can be fed into a computer, uh, quantum computer, and the results are then fed back into HPC flow. So it's a hybrid kind of a mode, right? So the possible optimization of this use case is like uh, for autonomous driving, this will include highly like local traffic flow optimization. I mean, those are like pretty big problems as of now, which cannot be uh, like uh, eventually it will become a day to day event, but then now it is quite difficult to get to that kind of a traffic optimization. And even improvements in vehicle recognition, right? So then opportunities of QCs will also like likely be surfaced in like um, product development and R and D, right? Which uh, I mean, I'm already seeing few companies have uh, gone like OEMs have gone uh, for these kind of uh, announcements as they have like BMW, Daimler, they have announced some of the um, uh, processes are already accepting this QC subject, right? So the relevant use case also will be primarily related to like solving simple optimization problem in near term. However, when it goes to the mid term, think about like complex quantum DIML, right? So advancing uh, classification algorithm beyond the capabilities of what HPC can do. Then quantum simulation is also there, like simulation, like material property, which uh, like can can example is like improve the selection of development of like battery and fuel cell materials, right? Which are the their uh, tier uh, tier um, suppliers, the high tier suppliers can also use. For similar kind of compute, and then also the, the complex optimization problem, right? So what happens? I mean, reinforcement learning comes into picture. As similarly, what uh, Nepal talked about, right? Like uh, um, autonomous driving will definitely use perception models, right? The perception model training, right, through reinforcement learning is it, it, a quite a quite complicated approach, right? So what we can uh, think about, um, which I mean, people have not really implemented now, but there are few hypotheses that have been proven, right? Optimizing that can be used. To control the noise, right? The, the reinforcement learning has been already uh, utilized successfully in few hypotheses and experiments. But reinforcement learning is in like a, a where uh, is in kind of area where we have to make an intelligent decision. The agent makes an intelligent decision and takes action, right? With the reinforcement learning in quantum compute, uh, the learner sees some optimized pulse by uh, doing um, experiments with the quantum device itself, right? And then the reinforcement learning can like discover and exploit uh, new physical mechanisms that uh, are not uh, not we, we cannot be uh, aware physically when doing uh, or simulating those simulations. So, however, the disadvantage um, uh, in this is that the learner can't tell you how I mean the the solution was really come, uh, was found, right? So we will uh, not know the physics of the noise suppression because it was done within that quantum computing environment, uh, which the the, um, uh, the whole uh, agent have learned by itself, right? The agent learns, I mean, to reach a goal, and that is measured by the observability as well as the reward base, the, sim the sim similar kind of uh, complex algorithms that we have executed in the past for AIML, right? But the long term, when we look at that, right, the vision of quantum computing is like to uh, in applications will be like built at scale. Right, probably be um, kind of a one huge clusters where it will be shared across multiple domains, right? And then the I, I mean, what we think is that the focus will likely be uh, moving towards the digital security and risk management, as OEM will try to prevent the quantum hacking uh, or or communications with uh, in autonomous driving, right? Or, or onboard electronics, or maybe industrial uh, Internet of Things, which are like kind of common in, in our uh, space now. But it, it is not real at the real time piece of it is missing to some extent is because of the computation power, the, the different various scenarios that can actually happen has not been trained with the model, right? Um, uh, the cloud hosted assistants will probably improve uh, their coverage algorithms through regular training enabled by QC, but the com quantum computers like I will, will get, I mean, there is a hype, but there is a, 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 a truth to it as well, right? Because it, the quantum sensors can, are also coming up and which has extreme levels of precision by exploiting the like, quantum nature of matter, right? So it's not only computing, it, the sensors are also uh, can be used for like, uh, like seeing around the corners of the car, right? And um, 
and the quantum system will remain like extremely susceptible to disturbances. So it's not that we can start using machines which are uh, quantum computable machines, but what we are thinking like is quantum simulators are probably like uh, software programs that can run on classical computers, but then can give that kind of a environment for quantum compute with qubits. And then to run our uh, that environment, we will run our models and obviously have, they will have to be rewritten in different quantum language and run it on that qubit so to get get our uh, operation and optimization and like in this evolution journey. So I'll I'll stop there. Um, any I don't think we're taking questions now, right? Yeah, just, we'll we'll do the questions in the end. Uh, that yeah. was great. I uh, love the love the passion and energy around this. And uh, like as uh, we were talking a little bit before <laughs> this, I mean, quantum is just it's just amazing to think about what 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 right. can be achieved. Uh, you know, once we unlock some of these technologies, I mean, we we think about when we say quantum, we think about things like blockchain. But if you think about like exactly. autonomous driving and the impact it can have there, it's it's just amazing. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Srijani. No so uh, we'll move, uh, keep moving. Uh, so Lee, you're up next, and. Here we go. Okay, so before I dig into the slide, um, so just a, just a quick introduction to my involvement uh, with Siemens EDA. So my focus is really in the automotive IC ecosystem, um, where the key focus areas for myself are both uh, test, safety, and security. So. If we take each of those individually, uh, what do they what do they actually mean? Um, so if we first take uh, test, so we start talking about manufacturing test, uh, looking for those systematic defects that we uh, that were discussed uh, in in one of the previous introductions, and the fact that for an automotive device, we really want to have. Uh, devices entering service with uh, zero defects. So we want to make sure that any device going into a vehicle has has no flaws, no defects from uh, from starting point. Um, so we can do that in a number of ways. Um, we've got all of the kind of traditional test technologies. We've also got lots of enhanced technologies around advanced fault models. So so really looking for um, really detailed physical defects and really helping our customers achieve that zero defect goal uh, for automotive devices. But that's not everything. That's really just uh, getting the devices through uh, the design and manufacture stage and getting to a point where um, you start manufacturing it in volume. You've also got safety. So when we talk about safety, we talk about functional safety and and again, um, in one of the earlier introductions, we were talking about um, the, the standards around functional safety, the ISO 26262 standard, um, all of the kind of concepts around meeting the FTTI to make sure that you're testing uh, your device regularly enough um, in the system to make sure that you can pick up um, any, any faults that occur in a in a safe in a, in a safe way and make sure that they're addressed um, and the device and the vehicle are put into a, a safe state. And then we have um, security. So on top of making sure your devices that go into the vehicle are are safe, we also make sure that we, we we've got technology that enables you to make sure that the, the devices are secure. So safe from cyber attacks um, and and all of the, uh, the the nasty things that we see in the security world today, um, especially in the uh, in the realms of, of over the air updates. So in, in the past, when our vehicles were delivered and, and they weren't connected, um, they were pretty secure. Uh, but now that we're getting software updates over the air, there's another level uh, of attack that can occur. And this, the, um, the security landscape um, and the threat landscape isn't quite the same as the safety landscape in terms of um, security is changing all of the time. So whereas things in 10 years time from a safety aspect 
are probably have the same amount of risk as they do now from a security and threat perspective people are getting cleverer every day so the threats that we see today are going to be completely different to the threats that we see in the future so we need to make sure that um we're, we're not just safe but we're also secure as well um, and the, the real challenge with vehicles is the fact that uh, we're not just talking about one device uh, we're talking about multiple parts of the system um, and then we take a look at the the slide here so um, here we can see all of the different parts of the system and and, and one of the points that was made earlier was um, to verify that complete system and every part of that system, um, it may be necessary to drive millions and millions of miles. So, so one of the big um, things that we're doing at Siemens EDA in, in uh, response to that, um, that change is you may have seen the concept of a digital twin. So what we try and do is really model everything um, in, in a completely digital world. So not just the, uh, the ICs themselves, but all of the other aspects of the system. And only that way can we, we really start to model the complete vehicle um, and, and do that in a, in a virtual way, as opposed to having to get into the vehicle and drive it millions of miles. So we have this framework called Pay360. There we're able to model every part of the vehicle uh, we're also able to apply real life scenarios and real life data to that. Um, and um, yeah, so, so that's, that's kind of where we're heading with um, Siemens EDA, being able to model those complete vehicles um, and, and really model that from a digital twin perspective. And with that, I'll hand over to the next panelist. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lee. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, I would definitely be interested in learning more about kind of the, the ecosystem approach that you, you've been taking. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, oh, we also have a video. Should I just play it or? Yeah, it's only a 30 second clip just to um, just hit the play yeah. and that should. Modern vehicles are increasingly connected devices with growing volumes of electronic systems which control not only infotainment and communication, but powertrain safety and driving systems. To ensure the correct and safe operation of these complex systems, designers have to build in functional monitoring to ensure functional safety and security targets are met. These and other security mechanisms inside the chip ensure that the chip is not compromised in manufacturing, supply chain, or the field use. This is now particularly important with over-the-air software updates our latest white paper details some of these challenges and technologies from Siemens EDA, which help address these. Awesome. Now, moving on, Sweta, over to you. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you are able to hear me. Uh, I do not see the slides, though, Aditya. I don't know if it's just me. Oh, really? Can everyone else see the slides? Yeah. All right, I'll get going then. Okay, so what I'm going to cover here is overall where we need to get with the autonomous vehicles and what's the ecosystem that we have today that will help us get there. So the ultimate objective of the ADAS and the autonomous vehicle is to reach the level of autonomy, which eliminates the need for a human driver. To get this level, uh, there are various industry accepted stages of autonomy from level zero to level five. Uh, level five where driver has no control, right? The ca cars currently on the road today fall somewhere between level two and level three. Uh, level two vehicles would assist drivers with steering or acceleration, but it requires permanent supervision of driver. Level three is where vehicle takes over some of the monitoring of the environment from the driver using sensor technologies like LIDAR or high definition maps. Now the key difference between getting to the higher levels of automation, the level four and level five versus the lower ones is that the former allows vehicles to handle increasingly difficult tasks with minimal to zero intervention from the human occupant. Level five at present is not a fully realistic goal, right? Uh, can you move to the next slide, please? 
So for an automobile to be autonomous, it needs to be continuously aware of its surroundings first. Uh, first by perceiving information and then acting on the information through the computer control of the vehicle. The autonomous vehicles require safe, secure and highly responsive solutions which need to be able to make split second decisions based on a detailed understanding of the driving environment. So what are the building blocks that will help us reach to that required level of autonomy? So let's start with uh, sensors, the computer vision and sensor fusion. Uh, computer vision would use cameras and sensors to identify objects around the vehicle and signal fusion will gather all this information from various sensors and help the vehicle understand the environment. Now, though these applications exist today to a certain extent, they're not fully robust enough for fully autonomous driving. Even best-in-class applications have significant issues dealing with, for example, sig traffic signal lights. Okay. The other block that would be highly useful is the high-definition maps. These high-definition maps should include the 3D road geometry, boundaries, what are the allowed connections, along with uh, semantic information about the environment, such as position of traffic lights, road signs. And so these maps kind of act as an additional sensor. Then we need artificial intelligence and machine learning. That's another extremely important aspect. For the vehicle to be truly capable of driving without user control, an extensive amount of training must be initially undertaken for the artificial intelligence network to understand how to see, what to see, and then what it is seeing and making the right decisions in any imaginable traffic situation. So putting, it, putting these three major factors together, the road towards autonomous vehicles, it requires more and better sensors, smarter artificial intelligence and machine learning, high definition mapping, which will be enabled by humongous amount of data sharing. We talked about that earlier and even more connectivity. So that launches the vehicle in the internet of things era where the vehicle is the new thing, a connected thing, even more efficient than ever before. So, but it uh, at the same time in introduces cybersecurity and safety risks. Data is our new oil in the connected and autonomous ecosystem. One of the key element in the accelerated adoption of autonomous vehicles is going to be the ability to manage huge amount of data, gain insights, and even monetize it. Now, safety is the primary requirement and the key challenge in autonomous vehicles. So any accidental failures, so which causes safety issue, or intentional attacks, like security issues, it may result in severe injury or loss of life. So any missing consideration on in either of these failures or attacks may lead to terrible consequence. So now safety and security are interrelated. So they have to be aligned early in the development process. We have international standards like ISO 26262, which uh, we've briefly touched upon earlier, and also sec security standards like SAEJ 3061, or ISO 21434 for safety and security. Additionally, we need validation of all possible scenarios that an autonomous vehicle could encounter. Right? Uh, leveraging these high, fi high fidelity simulation to test those edge use cases and certify vehicles, that's going to accelerate autonomous vehicle adoption to a very high extent. Now, these are all the factors that are needed in the vehicle development, but there are also external factors that are key to the success of autonomous vehicle. Uh, autonomous vehicle will need new types of infrastructure support and maintenance, including advanced telecommunication links. I talked about connectivity earlier. We need higher speed connectivity to be able to share data and use it. We need near perfect pavements and signage markings. So planning and implementing, implementing these highway improvements may enable autonomous vehicles to be fully functional sooner. Then fully autonomous vehicles may not have the standard features of today's car like steering wheels, brake pedals, as there will not be a driver. So the regulations that are built today 
are uh, required to change, right? Some governments are taking a lead by modifying vehicle requirements for the, at least for the purpose of pilot programs and tests for such vehicles. But permanent changes in these standards are also necessary if autonomous vehicle needs to be commercialized. And finally, liability for incidents involving self-driving cars. That's a developing area of law and policy. It will determine who is liable when a car causes physical damage to person or property. So as autonomous cars shift the responsibility of driving from humans to the technology, there's a need for existing liability laws to evolve in order to reasonably identify the appropriate remedies for damage or injury. And then as levels of autonomy are commercially introduced, the insurance industry stands to see high proportions of commercial and product liability lines. So that will also shrink probably the personal automobile insurance. So with this, I'll wind up my thoughts and over to you, Aditya, back. Awesome. Thank you, Shweta. Yeah, it's, 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 it's fascinating. Like to an outsider, it may seem like, oh, autonomy is all just about, you know, advances in AI and you just, you just drive more, collect, collect more, get your more miles under your belt. And, you know, one day we'll get there. But like, if you think about it, if you break the whole thing down, there's just so many different components uh, to it in which you, and you need like perfection in every single one of them to get to that safety standard. Um, so yeah, this is, this is super fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, so moving right along, uh, we will go to our last panelist, uh, James, I will stop sharing. Uh, so why don't you go ahead and uh, share your slides? Great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I'm uh, Jimmy Herman. I'm the team principal of Carnegie Mellon's RoboRace team. Uh, RoboRace is an international autonomous racing competition. Um, and they're, they're actually in their second development season right now and hope to do multi-agent racing soon. Um, they actually own the world record for the fastest autonomous vehicle. So these are full, uh, full size, uh, very, very, very fast and very expensive uh, race cars. And RoboRace actually supplies these vehicles, uh, uh, the sensors, uh, all the hardware simulation environments to teams, which are both commercial and university and the teams are expected to uh, develop autonomous uh, racing software uh, in a competition format. Um, so yeah, autonomous racing is a, is a really highly, it's a highly complex, um, very dynamic multi-agent problem uh, that's very interesting for uh, deep learning research. Um, and the, the interesting thing about autonomous racing is that in many ways, it's actually a lot simpler uh, than street legal driving. I mean, you think about it, there's no signs, we don't have pedestrians running onto the racetrack, uh, the boundaries are well marked, um, good driving conditions. You don't race a Formula One car in the rain, for example. Um, but on the other hand, it's also a lot more difficult than street legal driving. You're making uh, very high risk, uh, very high speed, low latency decisions. Um, you're dealing with hardware operating at or near its physical limits. And you can imagine that uh, in such an environment, really small errors could propagate greatly in magnitude. If you're driving a car, for example, at 30 miles an hour and you make a twitch in the steering wheel, well, you might deviate slightly and you can very easily just uh, revert back and stay in your lane, no problem. Well, if you do that going 150 miles an hour, uh, your wheel's probably gonna catch and you're probably gonna flip 10 times and uh, you're, hopefully your car doesn't blow up. But <laughs> um, so it's a very interesting problem, uh, autonomous racing. Um, and our team is actually taking a little bit different approach than some of the other um, teams that are using more classical methods. Um, but our big emphasis is that autonomous does not necessarily equal intelligent. Um, and we want intelligent Asian agents on, on you know, driving. And the reason why is because in terms of complexity, deep learning and intelligence is going to scale much better to more complex situations. Um, and this is really important because like, especially in like autonomous racing, for example, you have a dynamic environment. You have agents with conflicting goals that are both trying to win and perhaps uh, acting uh, in ways that are uh, could be unpredictable. And intelligent agents can do much better. Um, uh, you know, well-trained intelligent agents can do much better than a classical one. Um, but the question is, uh, how do we actually transfer all of this learning from the simulated environment to the real world, and how do we do it safely? Because um, we're definitely not going to be training uh, racetrack or training reinforcement learning models on real race cars because they're very expensive and we have to crash a lot <laughs> for our agents to learn. 
uh, and similarly, we wouldn't be uh, you know, training some, uh, some model with real pedestrians, we would do it in simulation and then try to transfer it to the real world. Um, and this presents a lot of challenges. Um, and then the way that, that we're doing it for over is we you know, do most of our testing and uh, development in the simulation environment, move towards a hardware in the loop simulation environment and then onto the real world. But to do this, you really need basically seamless software hardware integration. Um, and you need to be using hardware that's uh, ideally exactly uh, like it is on the real car as it is in your hardware loop simulation environment. Um, and yeah, one of our main goals is really to, to bring uh, self-learning uh, racing agents to the, to the track uh, with RoboRace. Um, and to attract research interest, we've created uh, Learn to Race, um, which is a multimodal control environment for autonomous racing uh, using a very high fidelity simulator uh, with realistic uh, vehicle models, uh, virtual sensors. We only provide agents with uh, data that is realistically accessible to them on the real car. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, simulators are just bits. Uh, we represent things in a simulator with zeros and ones. And this is a pretty massive simplification of reality. Um, and, and again, motivating this idea of uh, transferring um, from uh, the simplification to the real world uh, is a difficult thing to do, especially for learning based agents. Um, and to uh, demonstrate this, uh, you know, we're, this is an example of a reinforcement learning agent that's learning um, from scratch uh, uh, and using the classic reinforcement learning paradigm where we uh, provide the environment and tell the agent, um, hey, you get rewards for this, um, but you have to figure out how to actually race. We'll tell you that, you know, completing laps quickly is good. Right, thank you. You have to figure out how to do this. Bye -bye. Um, and so, for example, in attempt one, it's basically almost not moving, just doing random actions. But after, you know, 100 attempts or so, it can, uh, uh, just with using the virtual camera as the input, it figures out, well, I can drive forward, but I <laughs> don't really know how to do much. And after 1,000 attempts, well, we're making it further and further around the track here. You can imagine after tens or hundreds of thousands of iterations, eventually this agent is, will learn um, basically how to, uh, uh, probably, it will, it will probably basically learn how to completely overfit to the simulated uh, parameters and probably complete laps in a near optimal time. So um, we're having a lot of fun with this and we wanna see this on the real track, uh, hopefully sometime in the, in the future. And uh, we will be really, we are released, we have released uh, this environment actually to the public um, that uh, you can use yourself. And we have multiple baseline models that you can run out of the box. Um, and we're hoping that uh, more research is done in this area in the future. So, and that concludes my brief five minute talk. Awesome, thank you so much. This is exciting stuff. Um, yeah, RoboRace has been, you know, making strides in the, it's, it's, it's just, a, it's again, it's like fascinating things that this uh, autonomy opens up, like things you may have not even thought about. Like you thought about robot taxis, you thought about shuttles and, and delivery vehicles, but hey, you can also do autonomous racing. Uh, pretty cool. Uh, okay, awesome. So th that was great. Uh, thank you everyone for more or less staying in time. Uh, and, you know, we, uh, again, we have a lot of great things to discuss here. And uh, I, I already see questions coming in. So uh, what we'll do uh, as we move into the discussion phase, I want to kind of kick it. I saw kind of a theme uh, in, in, in all of your talks where it's like, yeah, there's, there's excitement around autonomous, uh, but there's also a very, very long way to go. And uh, there's always been this, 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 this question that has, you know, uh, ever since kind of autonomous became mainstream, I'm going to ask you guys all the same question. And uh, I'll, I'll just go through like every one of you can just give me a yes or a no. So, uh, autonomous driving is it hype or real? Like, just give me give me your thoughts. Uh, hype or real? And then we'll then we'll have a discussion on that. So, Nirmal, why don't we start with you? Oh, you're on mute. I was on the mute. Oh, okay, I, I think it's real. It's not hype. Okay. Uh, let's keep going. Uh, Srijani. Real for sure. Okay. Two reals. Lee. Uh, real. Wow, three, okay. Sweta? Real, in a long term though. Okay, uh, and Jimmy? Real. Okay, so wow, we, we have unanimous consent here. Um, <laughs> so uh, Sweta, you, you, you said long term and that, that's actually uh, kind of a good segue into what I wanted to talk to you guys about here. Uh, so we've, we've come a long way. I mean, autonomous driving is not something new. Like people have been trying this since the 1980s, but like things have, changed drastically in the last five years where it has 
you know, because again, seven, eight years ago, no one would have said real. Uh, like I, I, I don't know uh, how, like what the real versus high percentage would have been back then. So uh, I, I'll kind of start with you, Sweta, uh, just opening this up. Um, wh- what has changed in the last five years? I would say one of the major reasons uh, this is becoming a reality is connectivity and IoT. IoT has taken a long way in the last 10 years and with uh, IoT and connectivity coming together and vehicles getting connectivity um, and getting much more information along with edge computing, it's just becoming more and more capable of uh, doing this autonomous functionality. Yeah, that's as fair. Uh, Anyone else want to jump in there? yeah, I would just like to add, see, the thing is um, that connectivity, as Preza said correctly, right, connectivity is a big piece of it, 5G and all is coming up as well. But then looking at the compute part, that is actually, that's a whole focus of the, I mean, every, everybody working in the industry, right, how to optimally uh, do like distributed computing, the NCCL protocol that has come in, right, with NVIDIA compute, right, how do we do distributed GPU compute and then going on to quantum, right, so that there's a, we can, I can actually see the whole roadmap being laid out. As to how we can get to that kind of a nirvana stage, I would say like the classical ML versus quantum ML, right? Like how can we continuously start reducing our loss function, right? How can we, the loss function means that there will be more unreliable and less accuracy, but then we are getting over that kind of a stage where we will be able to get over that roadblock. So I do see that that that's one of the main reason as well. Yeah, absolutely. And we will we'll talk more about that. Anyone else yeah. have? One, yeah, one sure. So, yeah, so I, I totally agree. And a lot of it is is also down to the the, the way the technology is evolving um, and how we're, we're, we've been working on how to make these devices and the electronics going into the vehicle safer, more reliable. Um, we're, we're producing a huge amount of data now, which we can use to to drive that process and make um, make these devices even safer than they are today. So, I mean, I, I I don't know about the other people on the panel, but certainly my first car back in the 1980s, the radio was probably the most advanced thing in the vehicle, and it was the first thing that stopped working. Um, so that technology didn't bode well. But if you look at where things are today, it's come on huge bounds since since then. Absolutely, Nirmal, you you also want to. So I think it's a it's a combination of two things. One is old, and the other is new. The old is there's a lot of stuff that has been done for the past forty years in testability, fault tolerance, and all that. So all that comes for free. In fact, if you look at the auto standard, they have borrowed most of the ideas and concepts from that. So. Uh, then the second new thing is Moore's law, right? As I, I think Shweta also mentioned, she mentioned IoT. I think the big bang that happened with the Moore's law is, of course, storage and other things, kind of networking, all those things at once. But in terms of compute, uh, Srijani was mentioning that. Uh, uh, you, we hit a sort of, you know, there is a term in physics where it says that quantitative changes lead to qualitative changes. So the compute capability reached a point where you can do perception like neural networks and all that because even neural networks is 50 years old, yep. but the computational capability allowed us to compete. So in, in my view, deep learning is now the state of the art. And by that, I mean, compared to human vision, human perception, or even computer vision. So those are the factors. And I, I know there are challenges out there like in terms of security and all that, but I think the technology is right. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember even like when I was an undergrad, which wasn't even that long ago, it's like, it's like what, six, seven, seven years ago, um, near, deep learning was just starting to become a thing. And uh, the neural network course I took in school was uh, basically, it was mostly you were doing, basically figuring out how iterations work on a, with pen and paper. Like it was so theoretical, uh, <laughs> even as, you know, uh, recent as like eight, nine years ago, right? So yeah, absolutely. Um, so we we uh, I will get to some of the questions here uh, in a second. Uh, there's there's something else I want to discuss, which I think is is kind of top of mind as uh, you know as we as we enter into 2021, since that is the theme. 
Um, I want to. I'm I'm curious in people's thoughts, and and uh, I, I'll open this up to all of you. Like whoever wants to jump in, just please jump in. Um, what impact do you think COVID uh, and everything we went through in 2020 uh, will have uh, going forward on this space? Okay, let, let, let me jump in. So Go on, Lee. Um, certainly, certainly what I've seen in the industry um, as, as we went into COVID this time last year, nobody really knew what was going to happen. Uh, what I've really seen is a real acceleration on trying to get systems in place, uh, systems developed. So everybody's trying to um, trying to accelerate the whole process of getting to, to level five. Um, and whether that's because we're looking at robo taxis and, and where where we need to be or I think at the beginning, nobody really knew where COVID was going to end. So um, there was a real focus on, okay, we could end up in a situation where we need robo taxis, we need remote delivery vehicles and, and all of those kind of things. So right at the beginning, around this time last year, there was a big drive and we had a huge amount of kind of new inquiries and new customers coming on board looking at this technology. Yeah, that's an extremely good point, Lee. And then what I would just add to it is that not only from autonomous driving perspective, if you look at OEMs manufacturing uh, sectors, they are trying to bring in autonomy uh, to a high level in there where we are like partnering with Bosch and others to see how uh, in the manufacturing plant floor also we can bring in autonomy, right? So that has been uh, got a, I mean, that has got a huge hype as well as I, what I'm seeing. I would I would like to add here that there may be some setbacks in terms of investment in autonomous driving as OEMs struggle to you know manage daily cash. Uh, although over the long term or even mid term, I see this just accelerating the development of autonomous vehicles. Uh, there is now also I would say I, I'd open up to everyone on this uh, though physical distancing how that would impact say robo taxis uh, that's that remains to be seen would would people start again moving towards having personal vehicles or still want to use public uh, transport systems or autonomous transport systems that remains to be seen yeah absolutely james do you want to add something to that Curious to hear your thoughts because I, I mean, you you spent a whole year in school in COVID. Um, I guess how if autonomous cars were a thing, like would would that have had an impact, or do you you know uh, do you see ourselves now using autonomy to prepare for pandemics in the future? Um, I mean, I think it's a good question. I think it, you know, I think if we like generalized a little bit to thinking about like accessibility, um, you know there's a lot of people that are unable to drive. They're unable to physically drive for whatever reason or the other. And, you know, I think um, COVID or not, you know, providing accessibility uh, to the world is, is a very good thing. And autonomous cars could uh, perhaps give uh, a lot of people um, more personal autonomy than they have today. So um, yeah, and from my perspective, I've been in school for the past uh, recently, all through COVID. So, um, I don't have as uh, polished of an industry view um, on these things. Oh. Yeah. Cool. Um, so uh, let me actually open up some of the questions here uh, and we can start going through some of them. Um, okay. So I have a question here from Faye Sue. Uh, it's a long one. So so uh, pardon pardon me, just, just uh, you know, bear with me here. So agree that the I think and I think this was for Nirmal I believe um, agree that the testability and redundancy are two key elements to achieve auto automotive the, the automotive safety goal. However, there is another element that may be missing in Nirmal's statement, i.e., in field continuous runtime monitoring and telemetry. It would be very useful to use in field data to infer the complex, for example, workload related failure scenarios and guide mitigation. Uh, would you please comment and share your thoughts? puts me in unmute. So I think those are good points. Uh, so thanks for pointing that out. So the first thing I, I agree with you, in fact, for FTTI, it's 
you need to continuously run these tests while the drive system is on because otherwise if a fault happens so that is one and your comment about telemetry is also valid because most of the cars are being designed with a sort of a black box notion where there is collection of data that goes on as you drive and that that can train the um, inference networks further so that collection uh, also happens you know in like in recommender systems or uh, stuff like that um, you you collect in scenarios if an accident happens there was this mention about i i don't know if shweta was mentioning the legal aspects uh, who is responsible for the accident so all these factors have to be sort of accounted for great point um so okay so now the, the next set of questions i i'm seeing this kind of a recurring theme in the chat and I, this is this actually is a great segue to kind of the next little segment here let's start talking about safety um and i think the the, the big question i remember back in like 2018 uh, when you know we would start writing a paper on autonomous driving and we would the, the first statement would be oh, autonomous ride driving needs uh, 11 billion miles or like someone would come up with some number like Waymo came up with one number and then, you know, someone else came up with a different number. Um, and then we gradually started seeing a shift from this miles based approach to a more intelligent, smart scenario focused approach, which some of you also discussed here. Um, so, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm going to just use, uh, Jimmy actually asked this question in the chat. I'm just going to use that as kind of the question. And then all of us can, all of you guys can jump in. Like are millions, billions or trillions of miles really necessary or do we need smarter agents? So Shall I... I'll open that up to anyone who wants to. Okay. Could I? Yeah, yeah um, please. Go ahead. So let, let me give a history, like where the trillion mile comes from, right? Trillion miles is uh, in the U S at least on average, uh, the total driven miles are 3 trillion. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, how it is computed, you can look at, uh, you know, about 250 million cars and you can do the math, you know, average distance uh, driven by each car every year is probably in the 10,000 or something of that, or maybe 12,000. So if you do the multiplication, you come to 3 trillion. So now Jimmy's question is very relevant because these 3 trillion miles are not necessarily unique because there's all these parallel cars driving, right? So one of the key issues where in, in terms of validation that I was commenting on in my talk is to kind of distill down what are the unique miles, unique scenarios that sort of challenge safety. And, and I think that work is still in progress. So a lot of people are working on with the virtual reality systems. And that is where you can conquer the computational complexity in, in trying to create unique cases where you can test the, your uh, perception algorithms, the drive system, um, so that's that. So that it's a possibility, and I, I think folks are working on it. And this is why, where I want to really bring in that com quantum computing discussion as well, right? So that see the is uh, quantum computing is like said to be uh, uh, more power efficient with modern compute than modern computing. That use of quantum tunneling, right? And they are expected to reduce the power consumption from like hundred to thousand times. Right, so here we have to think about how we can use in a hybrid concept of HPC and quantum compute because there are, as I was telling, there are scenarios where quantum compute is actually not as efficient as HPC, but the reverse is also true. When you talk about this billions of permutation and combination in a driving scenario, it's extremely expensive if you go into the HPC compute and sometimes it just cannot do all of them, right? The approach, what we were thinking, I mean, or, or, or we, are, we are still like uh, brainstorming a lot on these, like, like, do I do like a, the first iteration in quantum compute to get the approximate answer, narrow down your problem space, and then it will take like it's 1% of the overall compute time and then reduces it to like 3% of the overall cost. Then the rest of the work can be done by the HPC. So that way, what this is what I call the quantum tunneling, right? So reduce the scenarios by doing the first iteration of huge amounts of compute and scenario detection, mm -hmm. and then feed it into HPC. I think That's there's work being done in Duke and uh, Berkeley. I think Professor Saurabh, and uh, I think in Duke, uh, Professor Missy coming. So. They have done some very good work that on is. quantum and uh, not know. on quantum on this whole okay. scenario reduction unit. Okay, yeah. I see. I see. I mean, I can't yeah. talk about the industry thing, but at least yeah. available. Got it. 
Yeah, I think these are uh, fantastic perspectives, but uh, yeah, I'll continue on as, you know, is, is the, is the direction, should the direction be, you know, more and more and more, or should it be a focus on improved sample complexity? Because when I think about like a human learning to drive, and I think about this a lot because when when I'm training a race car to learn how to drive, uh, you know, it takes so many iterations. Whereas if I'm a human learning how to drive, I, you know, go to driver's course. I grew up driving in a car, watching other people drive. I learned from other people's examples and I get in the car and it takes me a while to figure out the actual controls, right? I press on the steering, I you know, turn the steering, I press on the brakes. It takes me some time to learn to adjust, but from a com sample complexity perspective, it's not that much at all. I can learn how to drive very quickly <laughs> compared mm -hmm. to anything that we're doing <laughs> on a deep learning perspective. So yeah, that's why I'm, I'm invoking this question is, you know, if we have agents that have a good understanding of the world, they have an understanding of their vehicle model, but you know, and can predict um, and generalize, maybe we don't need every single case perhaps um, to test. Um, so those are my thoughts. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and that's a very interesting perspective, uh, Jimmy, because, um, and, and this is kind of where I was gonna go with my next question here. Um, so we, we had, we had miles and I mean, that was, that was a very rudimentary way of thinking about things, right? Cause you know, ma machine learning algorithms are by default better, the more data you have, like that was kind of the first perception. Then that changed to like, like Nirmal pointed out, miles can be redundant. Like you could be driving 11 trillion miles in a, in a single loop and those, most of them will be useless. So then we, the kind of industry graduated into this thinking about scenarios and even like things like SOTIF and basically safety testing standards around that kind of started propping up. Many startups started coming up, or, you know, helping you with validation testing. Everything is scenario-based, but you're right. Like even for, for scenario-based testing, it helps us kind of filter out kind of what data we need, but it still doesn't help us uh, with the last long tail 1% of the problem, which is how do you teach a car to drive like a human? Um, and so that, that to me is still very much an open question. So I, I'll, I'll send that question back to the, back to the panel here. Um, is, is scenario based testing enough? Could I ask a question back to you? What do sure. you mean drive like a human? Well, basically, uh, when we talk about hundred percent coverage, right. You also mentioned it in your talk, what does hundred percent coverage mean? Um, if, if I, as a human being who knows how to drive can, can encounter a new situation, like Jimmy was saying, I might be taken aback by, okay, I've never driven in the snow, but I can figure it out while I drive and I drive two or three times. I, I can, I'll be comfortable driving in the snow again, but that is not how our, you know, uh, how our algorithms are trained today. Uh, that's, trained. I think they take it into some physical scenarios. I don't think that is correct. Right. I think just like you take somebody for driving, I know for a driver's test. You don't train the individual to drive in snow, or, but uh, I think in well, the, yeah. Let me let me maybe rephrase the question then. Um, so in SOTIF and all these other standards, there's this concept of uh, there's the unknown unsafe scenarios, but then there are the unknown unsafe scenarios, right? If a scenario is unknown, uh, that means that that's a knowledge gap. Uh, no matter how you look at it, right? Because if it was, if, if we could figure out what that scenario was, it would become known and unsafe and then we can get into our validation testing practices. Mm -hmm. um, but we still have that problem of those unknown scenarios, which we, the way we, the industry today tries to minimize those is just by driving more and figuring out more scenarios. I guess my question is, is there a, is there a, is there a better way to do that? Uh, to reduce that unknown set to zero? I mean, there could be policies, right? In certain, uh, like bad weather, snow, you can uh, train the system to not drive and just uh, park in a safe spot, right? So those are decisions even humans make, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and again, it goes back to perception algorithms. Can, how can you train the machines to uh, recognize weather or scenarios, like in addition to other inputs it gets through, I mean, radio signals and others, right? So this is being uh, worked on. It's not, I don't think there is a shortage of scenarios. Uh, people are, you know, I think folks are working. I mean, you look at it, right? Uh, in, in some sense, uh, um, with autopilot from Tesla, and even in our modern cars, we have this adaptive cruise control. A lot of the ingredients are already there. You know, I have a truck, which is Toyota truck, which is 
uh, I never used to use cruise control because I was worried that uh, if something comes in the front, I'll have to slam the brakes and I may not pay attention. But with adaptive cruise control, it automatically slams the brakes. And through radar, it actually detects lane and lane departure or uh, signals all, all those situations. And um, Tesla takes it to the other extreme. You don't have to have hand on the steering. Um, but th that is not fully self-driving, of course, because it will want you to take over. I would like to add another perspective here on what uh, else the vehicle needs uh, to be able to make decisions, right? It, it needs uh, additional set of data. For example, uh, as I talked about high definition maps, uh, those maps uh, could work even when the sensors are not able to sense the surroundings, when the weather is bad, for example, or the visibility is less, right? There's another set of data that may be needed in terms of sending the weather data to the vehicle, sending what kind of hazards uh, lie in the uh, future drive of the vehicle. Uh, all this data will help vehicle make decisions. Of course, it needs artificial intelligence to process all this data. Uh, it needs simulations to be able to validate whether these uh, decisions are ma being made in the right way or not. But this additional set of data along with even uh, crowdsourcing, right? A vehicle sending information about the road ahead to another vehicle in real time. That's also going to uh, improve the safety of the vehicle as well as its decision-making ability. And let, let, me, let me also throw another, another thought into this discussion. So um, I, I talked a little bit in my intro about what Siemens EDA is doing with this whole digital twin concept. And that doesn't just apply to vehicles, that applies to everything that we do. Um, and there we certainly have a, we have can scenarios that we can replay and we work with various agencies who can supply those, um, those scenarios. We also have other ways to make up completely unique scenarios. Um, and, and the one thing that, that you've got to be mindful of is you've got all of the safety related scenarios that we're we're probably comfortable with and we're somewhat familiar with, but then you've also got to start to look at the security based scenarios. Uh, and by that, I mean, um, things like phantom signs, phantom vehicles. So, so anybody that wants to be malicious can start to introduce these scenarios in real life, but could potentially fall the vehicle into doing something that it, it, it thinks is doing the right thing, but, could potentially um, could potentially be fatal. So it, it's a it's an we've moved from looking at this kind of static landscape, which is safety, and we've been trying to fill every single gap in that static landscape. But then we have to overlay this security landscape, which is which is completely dynamic. I mean, I, I've seen um, temporary road signs that have got kind of ghost images in that will reconfigure the speed limit to three or four times what the real speed limit should be. And unless you don't, unless you have the um, ability in your, your vehicle system to, to be able to sense those, detect those and adjust for those, um, there's a whole wealth of things that could, uh, could be done to your, your autonomous driving uh, system. So we need to be really mindful of that whole security aspects, which is uh, which is starting to emerge. So how do you how do you do that? Uh, and especially because Sijini has been talking about you know quantum computing. Um, mm -hmm. I know it's like who knows when that's going to happen, right? It's 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 a road to get there. But in in my mind, like once that happens, like all bets are off, right? It's yeah, because everyone has access to that, and then you talked about like doing simple things. If if manipulating like the uh, data that you use to train your algorithm, like that, mm -hmm. or like data you you're running inference on, like in real world, uh, if that can mess up a system so bad, like once you have things like quantum computing, like how do we prepare ourselves for those scenarios? Because that could have potentially devastating effects. Right. Yeah. So, so so think think about it in a similar way to your PC. So. You, ever since you remember you've had virus software on your PC which gets updated on a regular basis. How often do you actually get a real life virus in your PC? Very rarely, if, if at all. 
Um, so, so one of the things that we've we've really been working hard on is given the the ability to produce analytics data, and that that's one of the key technologies that we're we're developing is is IP that goes into your your devices, which can produce security related analytics data, and and this is why I, I was saying that that autonomous driving is going to be a reality because we we've now got the capability in general to both produce that data capture that data and then use that data um i say if we pull the data from 20 30 million vehicles into the cloud and you can, you've got we're talking about quantum computing we, we if we process that data we can very quickly update um all of the um all of the software that's running on the car um, to be able to kind of detect and mitigate against any new threats that that appear okay. so that's one thing that you can use that huge amount of data for and that's yeah that's, that's vitally important so exactly it's, it's, mm. correct and that is the reason i talk about reinforcement learning along with it but you need self-learning agents and the variety of the uh, I mean, it, uh, scenarios that it can get the learning algorithm uses like information to improve the performance of the agent after a number of experiments, right? So that kind of learning that can happen at the edge, right, is extremely critical. Reinforcement with, without reinforcement learning, these kind of scenarios, are, I'm not sure how we are going to tackle where the machine has not been treated. Right. And I, I do see a question on uh, talking about like a machine having like lower temperature and others. Yes. The cold temperatures are needed for stable quantum computing. That is that is true. Even the, the currently the 2000 cubic feet system that is there, it is it, I think it is 0 0.015 Kelvin temperature. It is maintained in that temperature, which is like extremely low temperature, right? But that's why we are talking about quantum simulators. They are software programs making it uh, make making it like hardware agnostic. So on, what they would do is like uh, in the in uh, it will run on the classical computer to make it possible to run and test the quantum programs in, in that environment, right? So that way what happens, we have more confidence on it and then start using it in the in the industrial manner. The industrialization is not gonna happen. It's gonna take like in five to six, even 10 years, right? But then uh, unless we start using it, know the what are these benefits that we can get from it, it's gonna be difficult uh, adoption, right? So, I mean, I, I'm actually, uh, we have even seen that BMW, Daimler and Volkswagen have uh, gone, um, I, I was reading that material um, like like few days ago, that uh, they are investing on quantum simulation for like material science, uh, uh, safety, durability of batteries. I mean, even Bosch has been in that same uh, group that they are like focuses on researches on solving partial uh, differential problems with QC, right? And this is becoming, uh, it has to become mainstream because otherwise these problems that we're talking about, like that phantom and all, that, that's not going to be resolved with our uh, H, uh, high performance computer. Absolutely. Um, and, and, uh... I, we actually, I missed a question on this in the chat. I think we covered it, but I, I want to give a shout out. So Gustavo Chaparro, thank you for asking the question. The, his question was, what do you consider are the most important security threats to autonomous driving in the in the long and short term? Uh, so I, th I think we, we kind of had a good discussion on that. Uh, if anyone has any other thoughts on that, uh, please go ahead. Uh, otherwise, I'll go on to my next question here. Just to add a little bit there on, yeah. we talked about security and how... Uh, vehicles need to react if there is a security attack, right? Um, there's also the security by design, wherein uh, you would want to make sure that your design uh, is secure enough to mitigate any vulnerability that may exist right from the design level. So ISO 21434, for example, uh, which is kind of a new, um, new regulation, but it's... Uh, not sorry, not a regulation, but the standard. Uh, but that kind of asks you to do a threat analysis and risk assessment during the design phase itself. Uh, that will help you determine what could be the possible vulnerabilities. How would you mitigate them and implement that in the design itself to prevent such attacks from even happening? True. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. So, uh, okay, so uh, staying with kind of the theme of, you know, safety testing, uh, uh, 
I have a question for uh, for Jimmy. Uh, so Jimmy, you've you've obviously been doing a lot of work with reinforcement learning, and you you showed us some some of your uh, you know some videos of your of your agent being trained in a in a virtual environment. So one of the big challenges that we think about when we when we talk about reinforcement learning is really the problem of sim to real, um, because obviously during training you can rely you have to one hundred percent rely on a simulator, uh, and then you know when you there is there is kind of a, a cliff to jump when you have to then translate that into onto deploying onto a real vehicle. So where do you uh, how how do you think about that problem uh, when when you think about your team as well as just re using reinforcement learning in general for uh, you know in in this space because it does have a lot of it does hold a lot of promise over you know supervised techniques but it does come with that kind of a challenge which you know uh, which lead to some people just putting it aside as, oh, this is an R&D idea. We probably shouldn't be looking at it too seriously. What are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, it's definitely, a, it's definitely a big problem because um, and the way you can probably think about it, or at least the way we're thinking about it is, um, you, know, you want your model to be robust. Um, so uh, whether that's new curves or new uh, you know, changes in the, you know, there's gonna be a difference between your virtual images and the real ones for sure. Um, and at the end of the day, you want, uh, yeah, like I said, you, you want your model to be robust. So how do we get that? Um, well, one way you can do it is to is through like a process called domain randomization. And so and you can even do automated domain randomization. Um, and so this the idea of this is, well, let's you know make our agent really good in this racing environment. And then, okay, you know, it seems to be really good uh, on this racetrack and these physical parameters. You know what happens if we change the friction coefficient a little bit? What happens if we change, you know, if we put a little a mask on the image and change it a little bit? Uh, can it uh, respond? Um, because you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, simulation is just bits, it's not reality. So, um, but you know, the more uh, adverse uh, the scenario that the agent can respond successfully to, uh, the more confident we would be that it could translate to the real world successfully. And this has been done in other works um, too. Some really, really cool stuff from OpenAI uh, among, among even at Microsoft Research. Um, there's a lot of really cool examples of, of, of this uh, simulation real transfer already, um, or, or a handful, I should say. Um, but we want to see more of that for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and so it also brings on this idea of, um, you know, uh, uh, like the simulation environment itself. Can we make this a adversarial simulation environment? Mm -hmm. Can the simulation environment learn how to appropriately challenge your agent? And make it progressively harder and harder because if it's too hard at first, you know, your agent might not learn very well. Um, but uh, you want to be making it increasingly hard, but also realistic. Um, so I think this is a you know an area of research too that would be that would be quite interesting. And how do we generate these uh, scenarios automatically in a way that um, complements the the models that are actually being uh, you know driving the car, for example? Absolutely, yes. It's fascinating stuff to think about. Um... Srijini, do you also have thoughts on this since, uh, you know, this is something you also looked into? Yeah, so see that the, what what uh, Shabhi talked about is like very, uh, very valid. But only thing is that, uh, see, uh, with all these APC compute and others, right, we will have to look into this uh, kind. So see, uh, the, the verification and validation framework, I, I understand that there will be uh, uh, learning at the edge, but the verification and validation framework from our simulation engine, right? What we, whatever comes out, right? Storing them with the proper versioning, what data it was tested with, and also the kind of param hyperparameter hyperparameterization that was done along with that model is kind of critical because again, when it comes to those kind of legalities, right? So of the matter, we have to be able to reproduce that. So those kind of framework is becoming very essential for these kind of testing and validation scenario, whether it's been a similar uh, hardware in loop or software in loop, right? Both. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of critical. Yeah, any other thoughts? Okay, cool. Yeah, no, this is this is uh, absolutely just fascinating to think about. And this is a reinforcement learning for me has also been something uh, which I've closely looked into. And I, 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 I feel like they, and not just reinforcement learning. I mean, there are other, uh, you know, there are, there are startups out there who are trying to take a unique approach to solving autonomy and, you know, beat, beat solving perception through things like unsupervised learning, like a startup called Hen that does that, uh, or like, you know, uh, your reinforcement learning approaches. So, 
uh, yeah, it, it will be fascinating to see like going forward how that shapes up and what an impact that has. I know a lot of work is being done in academia and research, but how that translates into, um, you know, uh, into real world, uh, in, into the industry. Um, so since we, uh, we, we have about 11 minutes here. Uh, so, I mean, I have a couple of different themes here, but I, I'll, I'll pick one because, uh, you know, uh, just for you know, members of our audience here who might be looking for a career in autonomous driving. So just shifting your gears a little bit. Um, one of the problems that I constantly hear about from, you know, the people that I talk to in the industry is that we have a kind of a challenge with talent uh, where there's a lot of, a lot of companies, a lot of money, R&D money is being poured into autonomous driving right now. It's a very exciting field. Uh, but we have a problem of where we have more jobs, uh, but not enough people to fill those jobs, which again, it's, I, I see that as an exciting opportunity for, for someone new coming into the field, who's passionate about this stuff to, you know, just really get themselves up and running. So um, obviously we have, we have two different perspectives here and I, I, I want to get both. Right. So um, uh, we have obviously Jimmy who's in school right now. And then we have all of you guys who are industry experts who will have all these openings for these people coming in. So uh, Jimmy, let me start with you. Like, what do you think a, a student uh, who's maybe just entering undergrad or or just starting grad school, uh, and they want to get into this field, uh, what do they need to do? Uh, that's a great question, um, and I I think uh, definitely be open to trying new things. That that would be uh, my advice for a student. Uh, my path wasn't uh, my background wasn't software or AI or anything. I actually worked as an actuary uh, for a few years uh, and kind of. Uh, got exposed to some machine learning and artificial intelligence and uh, gave it a try. And, uh, you know, the rest is history for me so far. So, um, you know, keeping an open mind and, and going and doing something, you know, go try a product. There's so much material out there. You can get up and running with so much. There's so much cool things in terms of getting people uh, up to speed, running, you know, all kinds of, uh, you know, AI or autonomous drive or any of these things. There's uh, the research community among, you know, and the greater, you know, uh, industry community has, uh, created tools available for, for people to run at things out of the box. Um, so um, go get your hands on it, try it, learn something new. And uh, uh, just, if you like doing it, just pursue it. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a great attitude. Yeah, be open to learning new stuff. Uh, Lee, let me throw that kind of the reverse thing back to you. If someone wants to work in this awesome world of infrastructure, simulation, validation testing, and wants to join, uh, wants to come and join Siemens, like what kind of background do you look for in people and how can people, and it's not just for like college students and grads, right? It's even people who might have been in the industry and now they want to move into this, this space. Uh, what advice do you have for them? You, you, you know what, it's such a rapidly changing industry right now that um, regardless of what, as long as you've got a good grounding and um, kind of base experience, just diving into this, um, we're, we're all learning on a daily basis, especially in the area of, of kind of security. Um, everything's kind of new. So as long as you've kind of got, I, I, guess, I guess the one thing that's really key is, is to have that imagination and that open mind um, to try and accept and try new, new things. So we, we've got a number of projects going on where we're, we're kind of really throwing new technology around, having a look. I mean, th this whole concept of digital twin and the Pave 360 and be able to model a whole, a whole vehicle uh, digitally wasn't around three or four years ago. Um, so this is all kind of new. So it's, it's having that, that, uh, that drive to try and say, okay, I don't just want to, I just don't, I, I don't want to just model my, my ASIC, I want to model the whole vehicle. Someone, someone's kind of had that vision and gone off and, and done it. So if, if you've got the will and the imagination, then um, yeah, I, I just say kind of uh, t take that leap and, uh, and kind of jump into it. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else want to? Uh, I, I look. I want to. I want to get an answer from uh, all of you, but I, I let him. Uh, I think, first I think um, mostly it's a collection of all the skills, right? So I mean, our perspective is we look at this whole autonomous driving or robotics and what have you is more like an embedded system design mm -hmm. and bringing all components to place, right? People with great software skills, uh, algorithm skills, you know, machine learning, deep learning. Uh, or even uh, because we are also a chip company, um, 
you know, skills in compute architecture, how to do processing, you know. So all those skills, whatever skills you had before are all useful, you know. Uh, in, in fact, the auto safety probably opened doors for some people with mechanical engineering training as well, you know, be, because of the, as you were mentioning, end-to-end -end models. So absolutely, it's actually a great uh, time to be looking for. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sweta, do you have thoughts? Yeah. So uh, what I've seen in Tata Consultancy Services, uh, where I work, um, Hello. The grads that are re recruited fresh out of college, there's a training program that they go through before they yeah. actually start working, right? Uh, this is where they get training from people who are already working in such area. This yeah. is how uh, the skills are actually being developed because we know it's not oh. a, it's it's a new area. Uh, everything is oh, rapidly yeah. evolving. Yeah. We yeah. don't have of existing course, people. With, um, I think Ali, your your mic is on. Could you mute yourself? You should be able to mute, right? Ah, uh, no, I, I'm not, because I'm not a host. Next Wednesday, maybe around the same time would be good. Hey, Ali, your mic is on. Could you please mute yourself? Yeah. Yes, I need to go back to the conference right now. <laughs> He's probably away. Yeah, he's probably muted us and anyway, we, we'll keep going, okay. hopefully. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, so my perspective here is it's, uh, as, as also others mentioned, uh, Nirmal and uh, Lee and all that, it's, you need to have the basics, right? Basics, right? And then it's, it's just about how, how quickly uh, you can learn and adapt to new technologies. So that's where uh, these trainings with people working in this area helps. And also uh, the other aspect is uh, uh, working with colleges to update their curriculum to uh, mm -hmm. cover these technologies right there. So that, you know, when, uh, when we have uh, people recruited from colleges, uh, they already have a good base ready to build on. Absolutely. Srijani, your thoughts yeah. on this topic? Yeah, sure. So see, I'll tell you, I, I, I'm, I'm a computer engineer, but it's been 15 years in my career and I have not applied like anything that I've learned. So I wouldn't say that you need a, a like a computer engineer or, or, or electronics engineer, these kind of background. Most, I mean, what, whatever we have learned, probably at least, which is at least 12 years old, it's like archaic as of now, right? So what I would definitely... Uh, think that is thinking out of the box because even the technologies that are there are not sufficient. It's not just joining this industry, right? Joining this industry and making a difference, right? Just think like, what can we do every single day when you come to like, what can I do new to impact, right? So that is kind of a thought process if we have, I mean, I think that is kind of rejuvenating and, and, and industries do uh, recognize that like every, like um, the XC technology or I mean, other places where I'm seeing that those people do get proper recognition because thinking out of the box is kind of, is a daily norm now, nothing different. <laughs> I mean, yeah, this field wouldn't exist if people weren't thinking out of the box. Exactly, so, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So the theme I'm hearing here is two things. One, be open to experimenting, be open to new things. It's it's easy. I, I usually like to say like autonomous driving is more difficult than rocket science because obviously we have rockets, we don't have autonomous cars, but getting started with autonomous driving is so much more easier than getting started with rocket science. So, and then the second theme I'm hearing is uh, it. we have doesn't matter what your background is we probably have a place for you in this in this whole beautiful world that we're trying to create here rocket uh, science can go in the space without anybody inside there you go exactly <laughs> it's it's, 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 nobody it's will just complain throwing stuff in the it's just throwing stuff in the <laughs> air that's basically what it is exactly um, interstellar space <laughs> exactly so okay we only have two minutes left i want to do a really quick quick kind of just rapid fire with like just one single question for each one of you um we're in 2021 right now what is the one thing or one technology or one trend that you're super excited about in this space uh, as we go through 2021 and in 2022 and beyond? I'll start with Nirmal. Oh boy, I, let me take a whole lap to think. This okay, <laughs> who wants to go then? Srijani. You know, I already always talk about it. <laughs> quantum computing. I was just giving everyone the buffer to think. I knew your answer. <laughs> Sweta. Uh, I think it's vehicle to everything communication. Okay. Lee. Yeah, I, I think I agree with Sweater. It's the whole the whole um 
data and analytics and we're just starting to see this coming of age now and i think in the next kind of five years we're going to see a huge data explosion coming from from vehicles and, and that will really help drive drive us to completion on this autonomous thing awesome jimmy uh, probably to no surprise, but uh, you know, reinforcement learning agents are extremely successful in all kinds of virtual games, like way better than humans at basically any Atari game or Go or chess or any of these things. Uh, but I want to see more of these things in the real world. So uh, where uh, these environments aren't so simple. Yeah. And we're back to you, Nirmal. Yeah. So I think uh, this has been something that I've always been telling, I think with respect to autonomous driving, I think the hardware safety and all that, uh, in my mind, is a solved problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the biggest challenge would be the validation and the software bugs. So we need to be very innovative. We discussed trillion miles and all that, right? Mm -hmm. That is where the innovation can help. Uh, maybe Srijini's uh, quantum computing can deliver some goods. <laughs> but I think that is, that is the area where I think a uh, major focus should be. Or we could use reinforcement learning to figure out new scenarios that we haven't thought about, you know, modify the simulator, like Jimmy said. Uh, well, with that, uh, th I want to thank you all so much. Uh, I had so much fun talking to you guys, and I hope our attendees, you you guys also enjoyed this discussion. You you had a good lunch, and you were able to take something of value from, you know, from these awesome panelists here. Um, and, you know, with that, we will thank you again. Uh, we'll end this session, and we'll let you get back to your back back to the conference. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank Bye. you, everybody. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.